Hi, welcome to module two of the on-demand program on crisis communication. My name is Carl Zangro, my colleague at, at Powers and I uh, want to really focus in this module on stakeholder analysis, understanding our stakeholders. This really means the, the groups of people that we really need to focus on uh, in terms of communication. Uh, Ed, do you want to just briefly recap what we covered in module one? Sure, Carl. Um, welcome back, everyone. And in the first module, uh, we took a look at basically an overview of what is uh, crisis communication, uh, what factors uh, come into play, uh, what kinds of guiding principles are there to inform your decision, uh, the importance of advanced planning and thinking about communication before the crisis actually hits. And so stakeholders, we mentioned that in, in module one, uh, we're gonna focus on them in, in, in this module. Why are they so important? Why spend time thinking about stakeholders? Carl, stakeholders are critical for two, for two reasons. One is that during a crisis, an organization has to be thinking on multiple levels with multiple stakeholders, which isn't always the case during no, normal operations. It's, if you will, to everybody coming at you at once. So that's one important factor. The other is it's actually the stakeholders who determine when you're in crisis as well as when you're out of crisis. They're the ones that give you the signals. A crisis, many people think a crisis is sort of this objective event, but it's really determined by, by your stakeholders and what they're feeling and how they're reacting what, to what's occurred. All right. Give us some examples. What, what are some fairly typical stakeholder groups uh, that, that we can think about? So um, within the module that we're putting together, um, there's some information on 10 common stakeholder groups that would apply to most midsize and, and large organizations. And these range from um, employees and customers on the one hand, uh, to government regulators and competitors on, on the other hand. And we look at not only who are these people, but what motivates them? Uh, what's their relationship to your organization? I think it's fair to say too, Ed, that uh, not every organization is gonna have the exact same set of stakeholders that uh, Nonprofits may have somewhat different mix of stakeholders than, than a business, a large business versus a small business, a global business versus a local business. Uh, but I think the 10 that you're talking about and that folks will read about are some pretty typical examples of, of stakeholder groups that you run across. Let me ask you this. Uh, can we assume that in a crisis situation, stakeholder groups think alike, have the same interests? No, they, they very much um, have their own specific interests. And um, a simple example, um, think about employees in the midst of a crisis. What, what are they looking for? And the current coronavirus situation is a great example. Um, they're worried about job security, whether they'll actually have a job. In a related way, they're worried about their pay and benefits. And for those who are still working, they're worried about the working conditions. Is it, is it safe? So those are their issues, not issues, those are their concerns. Those are their uh, key factors. On the other hand, take um, stockholders, for example, you know, uh, individuals or uh, entities that have invested money into a company. Um, their motivation, their interest is quite simple. They want that investment to go up. They want the stock price to go up. So an organization that has a crisis, um, say um, it's a biopharmaceutical company that's failed a drug trial and a very promising drug that was anticipated to be, um, you know, very bring in uh, strong revenues and create lots of customers, all of a sudden isn't looking so, so great uh, following the reviews. Um, and or that organization has to think about its employees, 
Um, we've invested in the staff that's helped us develop this drug, but also has to think about its stockholders um, who are banking on the stock going up as a result of successful investment into, into drug development. So you've got two competing interests there of one wanting to help the employees who have, um, you know, help you grow and help you succeed at the same time wanting to reward your investors uh, for the money that they've invested in your company. Now, sometimes you have conflicting interests and, you know, certainly uh, as, as communicators, whether you're in a crisis situation or not, whenever you're thinking about communication, we really encourage people to do what we call a stakeholder analysis. It's a very simple thing to do. You can kind of put it together in a table. It lists the stakeholder groups kind of in the, in the first column. And then you're thinking about in the second column, what do we know about them? What attributes do they have? Uh, often very objective attributes like demographics. Uh, another column that is more sort of where, what are they thinking? What are their expectations? So this is kind of what's on their mind. And you can bullet point these items. A third column, uh, the other next column that we'd recommend is what are, what are their communication preferences? Because we know different groups have different preferences in terms of the way they receive information. In a crisis, we don't wanna be figuring that out at the last minute. And, and the last column is thinking through what impact do we want to have on those attitudes, expectations. And I think if you can do this uh, very simply, not just in a crisis situation, but in any communication situation, really thinking through, spending a bit of time with you, yourself, your team, on really trying to understand that audience, those groups that you hope to have a positive, effective communication with. And, and it pays dividends uh, in the long run. Another thing I wanna ask you about is, once we've done our stakeholder analysis, how do we prioritize them? Is there a kind of self-evident way that we prioritize who we communicate with first? So, Carl, there are a couple of answers to that. Uh, so one is the all stakeholders should be informed um, equally in the sense that uh, all stakeholders have a stake um, in the crisis uh, that's unfolding. They have an interest in what the what's occurring and the impact on them. On the other hand, there are two factors that come into play that suggest prioritization. One is um, who are those stakeholders that ultimately are most, most critical to your success um, at that given point in time. And um, that's simply uh, a factor, you know, a fact of operating a business or, or operating an organization. The other factor is related to the impact that the stakeholder can have on you. Let me give you an example of what I mean by this. Um, say that you are working for a fast food chain and the chain has had a series of cases of people uh, becoming ill through food poisoning. And the regulator, whether at the state or the federal level, might be giving signals directly to the company uh, perhaps even through press interviews, because the press is now um, covering all these cases of people becoming ill, uh, that it's going to be coming down hard on the organization with tighter regulations, potential penalties, things of that sort. So in that case, um, the organization has to prioritize the, the regulator as a key stakeholder, because they have power in that instance. They have the ability to impact how well that organization can operate. I know that you also feel very strongly that there are two categories of stakeholders that we really need to pay particular attention to. One being perhaps victims of a, of a crisis situation and the other being employees. And you know, sometimes we forget about employees. Uh, we, we kind of assume that our crisis communication efforts should be directed outwardly influencing those external groups uh, that will be talking about us and we forget about the employees 
how do you feel about that? Where, where do maybe a word about victims, which is kind of fairly self-evident maybe, um, what about employees too? Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right, Carl. There are two special categories um, in crisis communications and you've touched upon both of them. Victims, um, by definition, uh, are those who are impacted by what's going on or, or potentially impacted um, in, in any number of, of different ways. And so it's important that the company's communications are directed towards those individuals um, and what they're doing to um, resolve the problem and um, assist those who have been affected. Um, similar to something we talked about in module one, this is easier said than done because um, there's always a fear, particularly in larger organizations, that by um, offering assistance and trying to reach out to those who've been impacted, you're demonstrating liability. And so the organization has to get over that hurdle to say, no, we're going to do the right thing. We're going to demonstrate the right value, values um, and we'll deal with all the legal fallout later. That's not what we need to be focusing on right now. So that's category number one, special victims. The employees are absolutely right. Um, they're often forgotten, but they're so important because your employees are your ambassadors in the local community. Take two scenarios. In the first scenario, consider the employee who goes home, talks with uh, family over dinner, friends um, you know, and neighbors, and they ask the question, hey, what's going on? I see all this uh, information in the newspaper, online about what's happening with this crisis that you're involving your company. If the employee says, I don't know, I, I know what you know from you know, reading the media and, and, getting, and looking at social media, um, that sends a negative signal. It says um, the organization uh, isn't empowering its employees. Take a second scenario where that employee now says, yep, I've got all the latest information our company is doing X, Y, and Z. We're taking care of victims. Here's what we're doing to make sure this do problem doesn't recur. We're really on top of this. It's unfortunate it happened, but we're being very proactive. Uh, your employee now is one of many ambassadors out there helping to get that message out in the community. Yeah, and, and you know, I can recall instances in my own career where employees learned about a crisis situation from the news and the impact on morale can be devastating uh, because employees, and, and here's another thing, I think, Ed, if we had been talking about crisis communication 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, a, a different conversation, I think. Uh, what we've seen with all of our stakeholder groups is rising expectations for transparency, for candor, for quick response, uh, full di disclosure to the extent that that's possible. You know, without, we always warn organizations, don't come out with messages that are premature, that you're gonna have to change because you don't have all the relevant information. But the fact is that there is a, a, an expectation that information will flow rapidly and, and clearly and consistently. We'll talk about that more in module three. But, uh, you know, it's just so essential to recognize that expectations have changed. And in fact, now many of our stakeholder groups are communicating with each other. I mean, social media, user-generated communication, uh, we can't manage a crisis situation the way we thought we could 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, that, what do you feel? I mean, I, I, I think using the term managing the crisis is just uh, a, you know, last century kind of concept. You're, you're absolutely spot on, uh, Carl. The word manage in communications has been replaced by the word influence and influence relates to exactly the characteristics you were mentioning, um, being forthcoming, um, being continual in communicating, acknowledging what you don't know, and showing humanity, showing some authenticity um, in the midst of difficult situations, which can be very hard for organizations, corporations, which um, have been trained over years uh, to be stoic. 
Um, it's um, yes, you want to come across as, um, as as having a great plan and um, being focused, but at the same time demonstrating that you are human in all this as well. Absolutely, and when I think about you know when we talk about stakeholder activism or employee activism, you know that's a reality. That that's part of the mix now, and. Uh, we just have to be agile when we're thinking about communication, communicating during a crisis. I think you've made the point that we need to spend a lot of time listening during a crisis, and uh, we can't always predict how people are going to respond. I mean, uh, uh, what do we do in this situation? Uh, there, there's no formula, right? I mean, we simply have to be monitoring the conversation among those stakeholder groups that matter to us and adopt as authentically and credibly as we can. I mean, is that fair to say? Uh, absolutely. Again, well said. It's, um, I think back to um, the, what, where we started the discussion in the first module with what constitutes a crisis. So it's a negative event that's followed by stakeholder reaction or perception of that event and then ultimately by their behavior, their, their response to that. And in extreme cases um, where there's this strong pushback, uh, it results in activism, which can be devastating to, to an organization and completely disruptive. So if you have product boycotts, if you have protests in front of the facility, if you have lawsuits being filed left and right against the organization based on what's happening, all completely disruptive. And to your point, um, our profession, uh, the PR, the communications profession, can be a great facilitator in helping to, one, avoid that situation, and two, to resolve it. And there are two aspects uh, that you've touched upon, Carl, that are critically important. One is listening to stakeholders. What are they saying? And then two, being open-minded to try and figure out, so is there a way? Oftentimes, there's no perfect solution. What, for instance, if there, if there have been injuries and death, you, you, you can't turn those situations around, but what can be the right thing to do um, by responding to that, to show those who are affected that, again, your values are, as we discussed earlier, are in the right place and um, that you're an organization to be trusted. Yeah, you know, it, it strikes me that that emotional component is sometimes something that we forget about, not only how people respond emotionally to a crisis situation. Uh, and, and if we neglect that emotional dimension, that will, uh, I think, have a, a negative effect on our ability to communicate effectively and honestly. We have to recognize that there's an emotional component. The other side of it too is, uh, to your point, let's say uh, some stakeholder groups respond very critically to what we're doing or how we're acting. I think the worst response is kind of a defensiveness on the part of, of the team managing, trying to organize the communication. Uh, it's not a tie, it's a natural response perhaps, uh, but I think we have to kind of hold ourselves a little bit emotional distance from the response so that we can really sort of assimilate it, understand why is it, what, where's it coming from, and how can we respond legitimately to that, whatever that is, you know, even if it's negative. So it's kind of, we have that responsibility ourselves to uh, understand there will be emotional reactions and we have to say, hey, that's valid. We may disagree with it or agree with it, but it, it's happening. We have to respond. Carl, I build upon what you've said. Again, I agree fully, and I build on it in, with a couple of thoughts. One is the current situation with coronavirus really uh, validates um, and reinforces what you're saying. Um, thinking of just us as the general public and virtually any stakeholder group, we're reacting with fear anxiety, uh, stress, uncertainty, confusion. 
and that's that's human. That's um, the, it, you can't dictate how people are, are are going to respond. You have to acknowledge it and factor it in into the equation. So, um, what appears to be a perfectly logical response or plan to deal with the crisis may completely av avoid or ignore the emotional component, and it will fail uh, for, for for that very reason. And so that that emotional component is important. And then to your point about the organization. It is, again, even for an organization, because it's made up, the leaders are people, it's natural to want to circle the wagons when you're being attacked, which is often what happens um, in a crisis. But it's the opposite of what's ultimately going to get you out of the crisis through your communications by acknowledging others' pain and discomfort and uncertainty. Um, you're starting to build the bridge that will help you find the solutions that will um, collectively get you through the crisis. You know, Ed, we've just here touched on some of the elements of stakeholder analysis. Tell us a little bit about the materials uh, that the folks who are engaged with this program can delve into and, and learn more about just this critical, critical component of crisis communication. Yeah, absolutely. So first we have um, a slide deck um, with notes that delves in more detail uh, with what we've uh, been discussing uh, right here, Carl. Um, we have a couple of, of, of articles that tie into the material as well. Uh, one's on stakeholder mapping during a crisis, identifying and figuring out how best to communicate with stakeholders. Um, and we also have another article that's contemporary dealing with communicating during the corona, coronavirus crisis. The case study that we're using in, in this module that we've pulled is uh, one from um, last year, 2019, involving a utility, Georgia Power, and how it had to communicate with multiple stakeholders simultaneously after Hurricane Michael uh, devastated the region and knocked out power to large, a large swath of its customers. Um, there's also, um, once again, a quiz that uh, sort of uh, highlights some of the key concepts from the module that uh, for our participants, uh, they'll have the opportunity to take and uh, move towards the digital badge associated with this mini course. Yeah, I think there's some really good material here to dive into. Encourage everyone to think about stakeholder analysis. Do a little bit on your own. It, it's a good exercise. And that sets the stage. You've done a really good, solid stakeholder analysis to then go out, think about the messages, the channels, and in module three, we're going to be providing some best practices, some ideas for doing that piece of the response. But certainly you start with stakeholder analysis. And if you have a solid one, then you're in a much better position to craft communication that's really going to have the kind of impact that you want it to have, that you need it to have, uh, to help your organization build on its reputation, manifest its values in, in a very, often a very, very difficult situation. So we look forward to seeing you uh, at the beginning of module three. Take care.